It is good to be able to be together, to study together tonight. Last week we were in Ohio for a little bit. We had a guest speaker in a sense. We had the video about dinosaurs by Eric Lyons from Apologetics Press down in Montgomery, Alabama. We appreciate his uh, skill in delivering that and the research that went into that. I hope that was helpful in some way as Eric just kind of briefly summarized some of the evidence that dinosaurs and humans lived together at some point, as we would expect, as we learned last uh, uh, a couple weeks ago in the Creation Week in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And if you want to explore that further, I would certainly invite you to check out apologeticspress.org for more information on that. Go to their website, do a quick search for dinosaurs, and you will find all kinds of information on there. I hope to see you all in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30, at least for those of you in the Madison area. We are returning to our new study of uh, Paul's letters to the church in Thessalonica. So if you're in the area, if you have not been attending in person, this would be a uh, just a great time to jump in. Caleb did a wonderful job this past week for the very first time teaching. Uh, at this congregation at least. I'm not sure whether John told Caleb that this was a life sentence. Uh, I might have held that back, I don't know, but Caleb did a wonderful job looking at Paul's first visit to Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. So we got the introductory material out of the way this past week, and now I believe we are ready to jump into 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So if you want to come prepared for class, uh, it'd be great to read through the books of First and Second Thessalonians getting ready for that. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our new study of the book of Genesis. We've been here for about a month on this. Genesis is a book of beginnings. This is what the word Genesis means. It was written by Moses, at least a vast majority of it was. And in the first three chapters, we've looked at the creation in chapter 1, focusing in on the creation of man and woman in chapter 2, and then looking at the fall, the first sin in chapter 3. And two weeks ago, we left off at the end of chapter 3 with God driving Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. They are now wearing coats of skin. We assume to protect them from the harsh environment that they are about to experience. Life is about to get very difficult for them, as opposed to the way it was in the Garden. Well, this brings us to Genesis chapter 4 for tonight's class. So we start tonight with the first paragraph. This is Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Genesis 4, verses 1 through 8. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. In the opening verses, we find that Adam and Eve have children, starting with Cain. And at the birth of Cain, Eve recognizes that this child is a gift from God, so full of potential a lot of positive things she was able to say here, I'm sure. Children are not always appreciated like this today, of course, but Eve realizes that God played a role in this process. I think of one of the few psalms written by Solomon over in Psalm 127, where Solomon says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. And so maybe in a similar way, Eve realizes that Cain is certainly a gift from the Lord. And then she also gives birth to Abel. I would just note here, some have speculated that Cain and Abel were twins. We don't know this for sure. Uh, but maybe you noticed how Eve conceives and then gives birth to Cain. And then she also gives birth to Abel. And it may be kind of interesting that uh, there is no reference to a second con conception. So she conceives, gives birth to Cain, 
then she also gives birth to Abel. So it's not a done deal, uh, but I think that we at least see the possibility of these two being twins, and I just wanted to point that out since there has been some written on this in the past. At the end of verse 2, Moses notes that Abel is a keeper of flocks, but Cain is a tiller of the ground. And I know sometimes we realize this today, kids can be very different from each other, even between twins, if that's what the case is here. But even if they weren't twins, uh, kids can obviously be very different from each other. I'm assuming that Cain and Abel saw their dad probably do both of these things. Uh, work with the animals as well as work with the crops. And uh, this is what we see here. Abel goes in the flock direction and Cain tills the ground and he raises crops on his part. In verses 3 and 4, Cain and Abel bring offerings to God. And there is a lot that we do not know about these offerings. I kind of wish we knew uh, why they were bringing offerings. I think that'd be a good question to ask in the first place. Someday we'll know about that, hopefully. You know, was this a special day of some kind? Was this commanded at a certain time? Or was this simply in response to a specific sin on their part? I mean, there's a whole lot that we do not know here. But we do know that Cain, as a farmer, brings his offering from the crops and from the fruit of the ground. And then Abel, on the other hand, brings his offering from the firstlings of the flock and of their fat portions. And so Cain brings crops, Abel brings animals. Uh, not only this, but I would also note that Abel is specifically described as bringing the first or firstlings of his flocks. Uh, but Cain simply brings something of the fruit of the ground, not necessarily the first fruits of the ground, as Moses would go on and specify uh, a number of years later. So this may or may not be significant. I'm not saying that it is significant, but it is at least interesting to me that we have those distinctions here. And it seems that Moses includes this here for a reason, that uh, Abel brings the best of what he had, while Cain is simply described as bringing something. Uh, in the middle of verse 4, as well as into verse 5, we find that the Lord has regard for Abel and his offerings, but for Cain and his offering, he has no regard. And let's just make a quick note there. It's not just that God regards the offering, but God also re uh, regards the giver of the offering. So it's more than just... Uh, the items that are offered. Uh, some have suggested that animals are simply better offerings than crops, that uh, maybe um, one is accepted because it is a blood offering while the other is not. However, uh, later in scripture, God asks, actually asks for grain offerings from time to time under certain circumstances. So there must be more to it than that. Uh, I personally take this as a clue that God has a regard and no regard, not just for the two offerings, but as I just briefly referred to earlier, uh, for Cain and Abel themselves. So I hope that we notice that. Uh, God had regard for Abel and for his offering and had no regard for Cain and for his offering. So there is uh, definitely some kind of connection between the offering and the one who is making the offering. In other words, God isn't just concerned about the stuff. He's not just concerned about the offering itself, but God is concerned about the one who is making the offering and perhaps the attitude or the condition of the person's heart who is making the offering. So perhaps something, uh, there was something in Cain's attitude that was unacceptable. That's a possibility. Uh, maybe there was something in Abel's offering that made his offering acceptable and something about his attitude in offering what he offered. Um, but there seems to be a connection, I'm just pointing out here, between the offering and the offerer, if that makes sense. And we know this to be true today, don't we? Over in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, Paul says, Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So obviously it's not just the amount that is given. It's not just the size of the check. Uh, today, obviously, two people can give the exact same amount, and God can have regard for one gift and not the other. And that seems to be maybe one practical lesson we can learn here. And I'll admit that our uh, shift in giving over the past couple years has caused me to uh, think about our family's offering a little bit less than I used to, and that's a downside of everything that's happened. Uh, Pre-COVID, we would actually write out a check. You'd have to remember to bring a, a checkbook. Uh, checks are things that we used back in the olden days to pay bills and to transfer money from uh, one person to another. Uh, but back in those olden days, you actually had to bring a check to church. You had to think about it beforehand, bring it there, or come up with the cash, or do it that way, or whatever. And uh, now, a lot of that is automated, isn't it? As some of you do as well, we've uh, now had the bank send a check automatically, and we never see it. 
And sometimes I'm afraid to say we don't think about it too often. And so it goes straight from the bank to the church. Our treasurer opens that envelope, puts it in with everybody else's on Sunday morning without us actually doing anything or even thinking about it sometimes. And uh, we kind of realized this a few months ago as we readjusted our service as COVID seems to have passed over a little bit. And that's why we added a closing prayer where our elders take turns in that closing prayer and we try to mention the collection at the end of that service because it's so easy to forget and even though we're giving uh, there is a value to um, thinking about it and a huge part of giving acceptably is thinking about it doing it with the right attitude and how can i give with the right attitude if i don't even remember that i'm doing it so the money gets transferred uh, but if there is no thought, um, uh, certainly we are limited in our ability to uh, give acceptably. So Cain and Abel might have had an attitude problem. I guess that's uh, everything I've said here kind of leads up to that. Uh, the second possibility as to why Cain has a problem here while Abel is acceptable is that Abel followed God's directions, but Cain did not. And we have to piece a few things together to come to that conclusion, but that is a, a possibility here. And I, I make this argument because of several verses in the New Testament. In Hebrews 11, verse 4, the Bible says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, uh, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. So Abel's sacrifice, therefore, was by faith but Cain's was not. In Romans 10, 17, Paul explains that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So again, we need to make a couple connections here, but I think we're on solid ground in doing this. If Abel's sacrifice was by faith, which the author of Hebrews says that it was, it may mean that God told both of these men what to do and how to do it and that Abel followed God's directions while Cain did not. So I hope you're following along with me there. Uh, could just be the attitude, or secondly, it could be that uh, Cain did not follow God's directions while uh, Abel did. Uh, before we move on from verse number five, let's also notice how Cain reacts <clears throat> to his offering being rejected. He became angry and his countenance fell. In other words, he got mad. And it was obvious. You could see it on his face. And so his countenance fell. Maybe he was grinding teeth, clenching his jaw, looking down, looking guilty or whatever. Something was there where you could see that he had done wrong by uh, looking at it on his face. In verse 6, God notices that Cain is angry. God um, you know, looks at him and he sees that something is wrong. And I guess I would ask in this context, because does God notice when we're angry today? Um, absolutely, he does. He can see us. He knows what we're thinking. So absolutely, yes. And not only does God notice when we're angry, but he's also concerned about what happens next when we're angry. And so God asks Cain about this, not for God's benefit. It's not like God doesn't know the answers to these questions, but this is for Cain's benefit. And so God gives some advice and he steps in here, I would say almost as a wise and loving father. If we see our children get mad at a situation, often we're able to pull them aside a little bit and we can give some instruction. And that's what God does. He says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? In other words, it seems to me that uh, God is perhaps giving Cain a second chance here. And if you read through that, maybe you'll agree with that conclusion. I've never thought about this before. I usually focus on the next statement. But I just want to point out that the first statement seems to be God giving Cain an opportunity to make things right. He seems to be giving Cain a do-over and uh, kind of looking at him and, and wondering how he'll handle this. However, uh, notice God also says, and if you do not do well, so if you don't listen to my advice, uh, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. So this is where sin is pictured almost as a lion crouching at the door, kind of a wild animal waiting to pounce. Uh, we certainly think of Peter's warning over in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, where Peter says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And so sin isn't just a matter of us slipping and accidentally falling into sin every once in a while. But this is often a matter of Satan actively out there hunting us, pursuing us, looking for a moment of weakness uh, to, to jump on it. So God's advice, though, is to be aware 
uh, to keep our eyes open, to always be looking around, and to master it. Instead of it mastering us, we need to master it. We need to see it coming. We need to prepare for it. You know, if our neighbor calls us in the morning and tells us, hey, um, I noticed there's a mountain lion crouching outside your door, um, might that affect the way we leave the house in the morning? Uh, hopefully it would. Absolutely it would. And in the same way, God is warning Cain to be careful how he handles this, uh, because this is a very uh, dangerous situation. Unfortunately, uh, Cain does not handle this too well, does he? Uh, one thing I've missed in the past is the fact that Cain tells Abel, his brother, about this conversation with God. Isn't that a little bit weird? Hey, uh, brother, by the way, God talked to me about this, and this is what he said. That's just kind of a strange thing. I almost think of uh, Joseph telling his brothers about the dream. Didn't end too well for Joseph there, didn't. So, so I don't really know uh, why this is here. It's just an interesting statement that Cain tells Abel, his brother, about all of this. You know, hey, buddy, did you hear from God? <laughs> I kind of heard from God the other day, and uh, he this is what he told me. I don't know. It's kind of a strange statement here. I'm not sure what that's about, but uh, we do know that when they are out in the field, uh, Cain rises up against his brother Abel and kills him. Uh, I would note we are not told what method Cain uses to kill his brother. Um, that's not what's going on here. It's not... Uh, you know, we're not told whether he, you know, hits him over the head with a rock or strangles him or maybe he stabs him with a stick or beats him with a club or whatever. Um, we're just not told. And I believe the uh, reason there is the method is not important, is it? Um, what's important is what's going on in Cain's heart. So it's not about the knife or the rock or whatever. The issue is Cain making the decision in his heart to go out there in the field and kill his brother. So this is not rock violence or stick violence or knife violence. Uh, this is heart violence. As John would go on to say later in 1 John chapter 3, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. So Cain kills Abel because Cain decides to kill Abel. And as John says, his deeds are evil. And I would note that although Cain overpowers Abel, in the process, Cain actually allows himself to be overpowered himself by sin and the devil. And that is certainly the real tragedy here. Instead of learning from this experience, instead of uh, graciously accepting God's offer of a do-over, uh, Cain instead gets angry and he takes his anger out on his brother in the form of evil. So this is the first murder, by the way. And as we've already noted, Genesis is a book of first. So it's not the first sin that happened with Eve partaking of the uh, forbidden fruit. The second sin, I suppose, would have been Adam accepting Eve's offer of the fruit and doing it willingly. Uh, but here we have the first murder. Uh, here's a thought question. What did Abel do to deserve this? What did Abel do to deserve being murdered? Well, hopefully it's obvious. Um, nothing. He didn't deserve this, and this was uncalled for. Abel offers this acceptable sacrifice. That's all he did. In fact, Jesus uses Abel as an illustration. Over in Matthew 23, Jesus is condemning the Pharisees, and he says, starting in Matthew 23, 34, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. We then have another account of this with a slightly different wording over in Luke 11, where Jesus says in Luke 11, 47 and following, Woe to you! For you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve of the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute, 
so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God, yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. So Jesus uses Cain as an illustration of anyone who would persecute the righteous. And Abel is defined here as being righteous. So when people persecute us today, uh, they are simply following in the footsteps of Cain. And in Jude 11, by the way, Jude also describes false teachers. And he says, woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And so the way of Cain, therefore, describes those who persecute the righteous. Let's continue tonight with Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 through 16. Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 through 16. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Starting in verse 9, God comes to Cain a second time and wants to know, Where is Abel your brother? And once again, God is asking a question to which he already knows the answer. This is not for God's benefit. This is for Cain's benefit. And again, as I see it, God is giving Cain one more opportunity to come clean uh, on his own. This is what we might do as parents when we come in and see that our five-year-old has destroyed his bedroom. Uh, what happened here? As dad, I know what happened here, <laughs> right? We understand this. And uh, we're giving them the opportunity to confess, aren't we? We're letting them save face. Uh, what happened here? Oh, yeah, this is what I did. That's that's the preferred outcome. Uh, but obviously, that is not what uh, happens here. This is not how Cain responds. Instead of confessing, Cain gets defensive, doesn't he? Cain is a case study in how not to react when confronted by sin. Uh, first of all, he straight up lies to God, doesn't he? I do not know. And so here's the cover-up. I have no idea what happened here. Uh, secondly, he goes on to give this, I don't know, I, I would say snide reply. Um, I would say uh, snotty. That's probably not uh, really an acceptable thing. Sarcastic? I'm not sure how to label this. Uh, but he asked God, am I my brother's keeper? Dismissive may be a good way of putting this. You know, in other words, this is not my problem. Uh, it was his problem, but Cain is deflecting responsibility for what he's done here. And there's a difference, by the way, between uh, being my brother's keeper and being my brother's murderer. So it's not as if Cain just failed to watch for his brother, uh, but Cain apparently went and actively hunted his brother down, in a sense. So no, Cain is not responsible for constantly watching over his brother at all times, uh, but he is responsible for uh, murdering him. By the way, uh, where does this, am I my brother's keeper question uh, seem to come up later in scripture? Maybe it's just me, but to me this sounds the slightest bit familiar. Uh, personally, I see this in the question from the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus repeats the commandment that he's to love his neighbor as himself and all that. Remember, the lawyer wants to know, uh, who is my neighbor? And that results in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I would suggest here tonight as we study this that uh, like Cain, the lawyer kind of wanted off on a technicality. Well, you know, you got to love your neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Maybe there's some fine print where I can get out of this. And so I'm just saying that Cain seems to be using this question as an excuse. It is not a valid question. And obviously God doesn't deal with excuses too well, does he? So he comes back with another question. What have you done? So just a straight up asking him, what have you done? 
In other words, God knows. I remember somebody telling me years ago that a good lawyer will never ask a question in court that he or she doesn't already know the answer to. And that seems to be what God is doing here. He knows the answer to all of these questions. So he's giving Cain yet another opportunity to own up to it. The voice of your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. And as soon as I read this for the whatever number of times as I'm recording this class, I realized that what I said earlier about Cain strangling his brother uh, really isn't a valid possibility here, is it? So it was a bloody murder. So I'd have to go back to the uh, beating with the club or a stabbing or smashing over the head with a rock. There was blood involved. So let me, you know, he didn't drown him in a puddle. There's no blood involved there. He didn't strangle him. Uh, not necessarily blood involved there, but anyway, may tell us something about the uh, the cause of death here. If it were important, God would have told us about it. All we do know that uh, blood was uh, blood was shed. And so God says the uh, voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Uh, we might think of Edgar Allan Poe in his short story, The Telltale Heart. Remember that? Very scary story from back in the mid-1800s. Um, you know, when we've done some terrible thing, we know about it. It's in here. We know what we did. God knows about it. He knows exactly what we've done. And then often, I would also point out, others often know about it as well, or they will over time. So when blood is shed, uh, God takes a special interest. We may get away with it in this life for some time, but certainly uh, not in the next. The consequence for Cain, though, is immediate. In verse 11, in the absence of a confession, in the absence of any remorse whatsoever, uh, in the presence of these excuses that are given and these deflections, God curses Cain from the ground, apparently making Cain's farming especially difficult. Uh, the ground will not yield its power. You know, farming is over. You can no longer grow crops. And God makes the punishment fit the crime in a sense. You spill your brother's blood on the ground, the ground will be cursed because of what you have done. So instead of farming, uh, Cain is then forced to wander for the rest of his life. He is now a vagrant and a wanderer unable to grow crops. In response, Cain complains, doesn't he? What, what an amazing response here. My punishment is too great to bear. So instead of thinking of his brother, who he murdered, Cain is still thinking about himself, isn't he? It's all about me. You know, whoever finds me will kill me. This is a terrible thing you've done to me, Lord. So it was okay for him to kill Abel, but now Cain is concerned about himself getting killed. There's, there's no concern, no remorse whatsoever, only whining. And what I find amazing here is God accommodates this concern. Instead of saying, too bad, so sad, you should have thought about that before you killed your brother, um, God instead seems to be seems to do something to protect Cain in some way. And I'll tell you, that's not what I would have done, right? Um, I think of those jailers, those prison guards who uh, take on the responsibility of protecting murderers from themselves and from other murderers. Or we might think of those doctors, those nurses who uh, treat all patients equally without regard for what those people have done. I told you a while back about going to uh, uh, bringing somebody to the ER at St. Mary's and we sat across there in the lobby from a, some kind of jailer who was, you know, had a prisoner there in handcuffs. And doctors treat patients regardless of uh, their behavior in the past. That is their uh, responsibility, their moral obligation, we might say. They are certainly going above and beyond what many of us would be able to do. And I'm just saying that seems to be what God does here. Um, this guy murders his brother. God delivers the punishment. The guy complains. The punishment is too great. Somebody might kill me. And what does God do? He intervenes protecting a murderer from getting murdered himself. Well, what is the sign assigned to Cain? What is this sign given for him? Uh, we're not told. There's been a lot of speculation through the years. We do know that God seems to do something to identify Cain in a way that he would not be murdered himself. And we don't know what that is. Um, there's a curse on anyone who might still choose to kill Cain. So they will be avenged sevenfold. Um, this is not just the name of a band, is it? Avenged sevenfold. This is a promise from God, a threat for anyone who might choose to kill Cain. Let's pick up tonight with Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. 
Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived, and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city, and called the name of the city Enoch, after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other, Zillah. Adah gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal-Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Namah. Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Well, this passage is obviously leading us to the genealogy in chapter 5, giving us some family history. And we start with Cain having relations with his wife where she conceives and bears a son named Enoch. And Cain builds a city, names it after his son. Many people want to know, where did Cain get his wife? Maybe you've heard that from unbelievers. Oh, I got a good one for you. This is it's going to stump you and uh, disprove the existence of God and all that. Where did Cain get his wife? And the bottom line is, we don't know, do we? We're not told. If it was important, God would have told us. <clears throat> we assume, though, based on the information we do have, that this woman must have been his sister or maybe a niece at some level. A few things to keep in mind here. Number one, marrying your sister was not against God's law until many years after this, in the days of Moses. Secondly, being closer to the creation, they wouldn't have had the genetic issues that we would have with this today. <clears throat> and then in the third place, Adam and Eve lived into their 900s, I believe, allowing the earth to be populated rather quickly and making it quite a bit less, I guess, weird as it would be today. We might put it that way. In other words, we aren't necessarily talking about Cain marrying somebody he grew up with. Uh, but as Adam and Eve had other children and their children had children and those children had children and so on, uh, they would have spread out all over the earth rather quickly. Uh, beyond that, we don't really have an answer to where Cain gets his wife. Uh, we have several generations outlined here leading to Lamech. And with Lamech, we have the first example of a man having two wives. Uh, if you remember, this is not God's ideal. This is not God's plan from the beginning. Uh, Jesus outlines God's plan from the beginning over in uh, Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 12. Uh, but instead, this represents one of the first departures from God's plan in the family. Uh, the two wives bear sons. These sons go in two directions. One becomes the father of those who dwell in tents, kind of nomads, we might say. Uh, the other becomes the father of those who play the lyre and pipe, the musicians. Zillah also gives birth to Tubal Cain, a forger of all implements of bronze and iron. Um, I know a lot of times we think of people in the distant past like this as uh, cavemen. We'll get to cavemen later in the book of Genesis, but uh, we think of them as being very primitive. And we read a verse like this, just a few generations from the creation. This guy is uh, forging implements of bronze and iron. What in the world is going on there? A few things we need to keep in mind. God made Adam and Eve with perfect, what do we say, IQs? So not just genetically perfect with their bodies, but also their ability to learn and understand um, you know, we think of us as being more advanced than they were, but is that really the case, being closer to the creation? I don't think so. I think they were a lot smarter than we give them credit for, uh, people in the ancient world. Uh, not only that, but in those early generations, these people would have had six, seven, eight, nine hundred years of trial and error to figure this stuff out. Think about us today living 70, 80, maybe 90 years if we're fortunate, if we're blessed, and that's it. Imagine living 900 years with a perfect intellect and a world absolutely full of natural resources. Imagine the amazing things uh, that could be done. So let's not be surprised that uh, we have a reference here in Genesis 4 to this guy uh, forging all kinds of implements of bronze and iron. Uh, I remember going to a, some kind of display, I think at the maybe the Field Museum down in Chicago a number of years ago about the uh, excavations at Pompeii with the 
Obviously, the volcano buried everything instantly. They had displays of jewelry that were absolutely masterfully crafted. And the little clasps on these gold necklaces, uh, it was a he-went-to-Jared kind of moment. It was like something you could go to a fine jeweler today and purchase. And, and I, in my mind... That is not the way I imagined jewelry from 2,000 years ago. And it was gold, a perfectly clear, clean, and just the, the amazing, intricate designs. I was blown away. So I'm just saying, let's not be surprised by uh, technological advances in the ancient world. They were smart, and they had unlimited natural resources. Uh, at the end, we have some bonus information on Lamech. It seems to me that Lamech is simply a violent man. Um, killing a man for wounding him, killing a boy for striking him. This is like a road rage on the belt line. Just one, one thing leads to another very quickly. And so he's walking in the way of Cain, his great, 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 great grandfather. And he is proud of it, isn't he? If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech 77 fold. And remember, the law of Moses will eventually limit revenge to what? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. As I understand it, this was not a demand if your neighbor, uh, you know, hits you accidentally and your tooth comes out, you must go take his tooth out. It was a limit of revenge. You can only take his tooth out instead of uh, smashing his whole face in, as we might be tempted to do. Uh, but this is certainly in contrast to what Lamech had done. This is the opposite of restraint. Um, so he is a very violent man. And then we have Jesus perhaps making a brief allusion to this. I don't know if we've considered this. So we've got Lamech bragging about taking revenge 77-fold. Then we have Moses limiting revenge to an eye for an eye, so a one-to-one -one ratio on revenge. And then we have Jesus speaking on forgiveness and telling us to forgive not just seven times, but what? Up to 70 times seven over in Matthew 18, 22. So Moses limits revenge, but Jesus turns it around completely and he commands forgiveness in the extreme, the exact opposite of what Lamech was in the habit of doing. To me, these verses in Genesis 4 seem to indicate that we are heading toward the flood in Genesis 6-5, where the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And this picture is starting to get painted for us here. This is starting to run in the family, on that side of the family, not genetically, uh, but the people are making choices, especially Lamech. And I would also just emphasize that this is not genetic, but it is environmental. Remember, he quotes or he refers to his great, 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 great grandfather, Cain. I am doing this like my father, father's father, father, uh, but in a more severe way than uh, even he did. So this is running in the family in that sense. Uh, tonight, let's close with Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. Genesis 4, 25 and 26. Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. In the last two verses here, we have a bit of hope. I would say something positive happens here instead of the uh, wicked offspring of Cain. Adam and Eve have a son they named Seth. This man and his offspring certainly seem to be more spiritually minded as their descendants begin to call upon the name of the Lord, which seems to be a description of those who appeal to God on his terms, uh, not on their own terms. So they're not making stuff up, but they are following God's directions. Like Abel, they seem to be obedient to God, walking by faith as opposed to a vast majority of the others. The descendants of Seth seem to be an exception to the rule of evil and murder and revenge. And backing away from this for just a little bit, I think we're starting to see the enmity or the hatred, the conflict that God had predicted would take place between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And one of those passages, I think one that we read from the New Testament, that... Um, they are of their father Cain, or something to that effect. I'd have to look that up again. But uh, he is their spiritual ancestor, not genetically. That genetic line ended uh, at the flood. But we follow after the footsteps, either of like our father Abraham when we walk by faith, or we walk in the footsteps of Cain when we behave as he did. And uh, this is that enmity, that hatred that God predicted would take place between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. People are starting to take sides 
we might say. So a conflict is brewing. Uh, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. As I try to step back and absorb, maybe process what we've learned tonight, I've been, I've been encouraged by the reminder about worship. And just a lesson to take away here, worship is serious, isn't it? Worship is serious, and we would do well to be uh, the kind of people who come prepared for worship, to come prepared uh, to offer to God the first and the best of our lives. As I worship, I need to focus on what I'm doing. I can't just drift through it doing what I've always done, but I need to think about what I'm offering to God. And that goes not just for what we give, but it certainly goes for what and how we sing and how we study, how we learn, how we partake of the Lord's Supper. And so let's learn from Cain and Abel that faith comes from hearing the word of Christ. And we need to pay attention to that word. We need to obey it. We need to do what it says if we want to follow in the steps of Abel. Uh, next week, we hope to look at Genesis 5, which is basically a genealogy. We might be able to sneak in a few verses of chapter 6, depending on how we want to break down the timing on that. Uh, but thank you for being with us tonight and for taking the time to study Genesis with us. Um, I'm looking forward to getting back to this next week. Uh, but as we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God of mercy and grace, a God who comes looking for us when we sin, a God who is slow to punish, a God who takes the first step in reconciliation just as you tried to do with Cain and as you did for all of us in sending Jesus as a sacrifice. Thank you, Father, for offering your Son in our place. Father, in light of your great and amazing love for us, we pray that we would always be aware that sin is still crouching at the door and its desire is for us. We're thankful that you've promised us a way of escape, and we pray that we would have the wisdom to find it and the courage to take it. We ask for your blessing on those who are struggling with health concerns. Be with Denisha's family as they recover. Be with those who are facing surgeries in the near future. We pray that you would bless the shepherds and the deacons of this congregation, and we pray that all of us would be blessed with opportunities to share your love with the world around us. In Jesus we pray. Amen.